Sometimes there's difficulty. Sometimes it's very severe difficulty. Sometimes you don't know how you're going to survive kind of difficulty. So how to always remember Krishna in those circumstances. And the starting point, there'll be several references, but the starting point is from the original preceptor of our Sampradaya, Lord Brahma. By the arrangement of Krishna, um, Brahma made a big mistake, more than a mistake. He made a big offense by Krishna's arrangement to teach something and to give Brahma an opportunity to teach us this lesson and how to deal with adversity when it comes in a Krishna conscious way. So the mistake or the offense was described in the 10th canto, Krishna's enjoying his pastimes in Vrindavan with the cowherd boys. And one of those pastimes, Brahma just happened to observe. He came, because he's capable, he came to experience, to witness firsthand Krishna's pastimes in Vrindavan. And he happened to observe the pastime of Krishna giving liberation to Agasura. Agasura was one of Kamsa's cronies, his henchmen, who had a mystic power that he could assume different shapes, and he assumed the shape of a humongous serpent. And the, the mission was for the serpent to swallow Krishna and basically digest him, finish him. And so it failed. All the cowherd boys entered into the mouth of Agasura. Krishna then followed and entered into the mouth of Agasura. Agas Agasura closed his mouth, this giant python. And Krishna exhibited one of his mystic powers, Mahima. Siddhi, he got bigger and bigger and bigger and the python, because pythons, can, when they swallow something, their body expands and expands. But Krishna expanded so much as his life, he suffocated. His life air no longer circulated and the soul of Agasura popped through the soft spot in the top of the serpent's head. Krishna walked out of the, and all the cowherd boys playfully walked out of the mouth of Agasura. And the soul of Agasura went, merged into the body of Krishna. And the cowherd boys said, wow, nice going, let's have lunch. And so they went to have lunch with sitting in a circle around Krishna. The description is, uh, Krishna then exhibited another one of his potencies, that is, he manifested as many Krishnas as there were cowherd boys, each of the cowherd boys thinking, ah, Krishna is so attached to me, he doesn't even look at the other cowherd boys, he's just looking at me. Krishna is so kind, Krishna is so affectionate. But it's actually one Krishna manifested unlimitedly. And Brahma saw all this. And Brahma was thinking, this was his boo-boo. He was thinking, I wonder what the limit of Krishna's mystic power is. I have lots of mystic power. So I'll challenge my mystic power against Krishna's mystic power and see what he does. Big mistake, a big offense. So what did he do? He kidnapped the cow, the calves, because they're little boys now, it's, so it's not cow time yet, it's calf time, they're hurting the calves. He took all the calves and tucked them away in a cave, 
put a rock in front of the entrance to the cave to see what Krishna would do. And when the cowherd boys, they got distracted by their lunch and being with Krishna, they saw that the, 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 cow, the calves were missing. They started to get up to interrupt their lunch to go look for the calves. Krishna said, no, no, no. You finish your lunch, I'll find the calves. So when Krishna left to look for the calves, Brahma came and kidnapped all the coward boys, put them in a cave, sealed up the cave with a big rock, and went back to the scene of the crime to see what Krishna would do. Maybe he'll cry. Maybe he'll fall at my feet and plead with me, please give back the coward boys and the calves. Let's see what Krishna will do. That's not what Krishna did. Krishna manifested identical forms of all the coward boys and calves. It's a long, it's a wonderful pastime. So there's details and details. It, it, in Brahma's time, it was a moment. In earthly time, it was a whole year. So for a whole year, Krishna, looking exactly like each one of the cowherd boys and each one of the calves went back home because the parents of the boys had so much affection for Krishna that they wished to have Krishna as their son. Although mothers naturally love their children, they had more affection for Krishna. So privately, their hankering was that parental affection towards Krishna as their son. So Krishna fulfilled their desire for a whole year. He was, he literally, Krishna was their son. And the cows, they wanted Krishna as their calf. So Krishna became their calf. And Krishna directly took milk from the cows as a calf. Now, what mothers can't tell their child from another child. No such thing. But Krishna is so expert, not only he can create calves and children, he can exactly replicate their voice, their mannerisms, their temperament, their appearance, everything. They weren't robots. They were identical features of each one of the cow, cow, cowherd boys and calves. And this went on for a whole year. Really nice pastime. So, while that was going on, uh, Brahma came back on his time to see what Krishna would do. And it was, there were all the calves and all the cowherd boys. So we went back to the cave and they were in the cave. Then he went back and they were sitting around having lunch. And then Krishna smiled, and for each one, each one of the cow, calves and cowherd boys, he manifested simultaneously, along with the form of the boys and the calves, forms of Narayana, surrounded by everything. All the potencies of Narayana, all the material potencies, all the demigods, all the great rishis, the personified Vedas, each one. It was a big assembly. And they're all big cacophony of sound. They were all offering prayers to Krishna and Vedic hymns. Brahma was overwhelmed with the majesty, the Aishvarya, the mystic power that he wanted to examine. Krishna showed him. And then, as mystically as all of those appeared, the calves, cowherd boys, and the forms of Narayan, they all disappeared. Poof. It was just Krishna. Because Krishna is everything. He can manifest or he can withdraw everything. Just at will. He doesn't, he doesn't need to go to the office and, you know, get an education and get hired and go do something. He just wills it and poof. 
and he can withdraw it, poof. Just like that. Because he's all powerful. It's not, uh, you know, it's not, there's no limit. Not so called all powerful, but really he can do certain things. He's all powerful. He doesn't, he doesn't have to lift a pinky. He just has to will it and poof, because his potencies act according to his will. So Brahma was, he fell to the ground before Krishna and stood up and offered again and again obeisances and obeisances and obeisances and he offered prayers to Krishna. And the prayers to Krishna that Brahma, Brahma offered, it's chapter 14 of Canto 10, because the, the, the offense, mistake, whatever, pastime, is the previous chapter, chapter 13, and what Krishna manifested. And then come Brahma's prayers. So we're going to be discussing amongst Brahma's prayers, number eight, of that chapter. And it's a very, it's instructive, specific to our topic. It's a very important um, verse, there we go, for the devotees to understand and take shelter of. So that's what we're doing this morning. And we can chant responsibly together. Nice, well-known verse. Tate nu kampam susamikshamano. Bhujana evatma kratam vipakam. Ridvagva pur beer vidadhanta maste. Jiveta yo mukti pade sadaya bhak. Chant it one more time. It's a, it's a nice verse to remember when there's a difficulty or worse, a calamity or you're upside down. Tate nu kampam susamikshamano Bhunjana evat makritam vipakam Ridvag vapur pir vidadhan namaste. Jiveta yo mukti pade sadaya bhak. So I put certain phrases in color because the translation corresponds color coded. Translation, my dear Lord, one who earnestly waits for you to bestow your causeless mercy upon him, all the while patiently suffering the reactions of his past misdeeds and offering you respectful obeisances with his heart, words, and body, is surely eligible for liberation, for it has become his rightful claim. Now he's expecting that he's going to get a big reaction. Not a karma reaction. In this case, it's going to be an offense reaction. Um, that's what the, the reactions, that's vipakam, from his atma kritam, from his own actions, in this case, his bad actions or his misdeeds. He's, he's going to get spanked. And he's not um, going to invest an effort to neutralize the reaction or plead with Krishna to you know, make his reaction less minimized. He's ready for whatever is going to come. That's the, the message. Here it comes. And I'm expecting my faith is te uh, nukampam, anukampam, this one, anukampam. I know that your mercy is going to come. 
then the mercy will come in the form of this reaction. And <clears throat> what I want to do, instead of endeavoring to neutralize the severity of the reaction, is one thing. Rid vag vapur beer with heart, rid vak, my speech, and vapur beer with my body. I will offer obeisances to you in all three ways, just taking shelter of you. And jiveta yo mukti padesa dayabak, the last line is very important. Jiveta, um, jiveta indicates that you just have to live. We'll hear from the commentary of the Acharyas. Just live in this case means, we'll hear, it's um, live, stay fixed in devotion. Live a life of devotion at the feet of the personality of Godhead. And for one who does so, mukti pade, mukti pade literally means um, giving of um, liberation, mukti pade, sa dayabak, sa dayabak means rightful claim. And I could say it all now, but we'll I'll wait for the because several, this is such an important verse that many of our acharyas have commented on it. <clears throat> it's mentioned specifically by Rupa Goswami in our Nectar Devotion. Here's what Prabhupada writes. <clears throat> this statement, this verse that we just recited, of Srimad Bhagavatam should be the guide of all the devotees. And the solace is we just stay in Krishna's service without trying to neutralize the severe reactions that may be coming to us from our past Atma Kripam, our past misdeeds. And take solace that Krishna is kind and Krishna is doing specifically in the lives of devotees. There's, is, there's a purpose. We may not understand in the moment what the purpose is, but there's a purpose and we'll hear in the commentary just in a moment what that purpose is. If the devotee passes his days in that spirit, it is certain that he is going to be promoted to the abode of the Lord. Because as our topic for this weekend, uh, always remember Krishna, never forget Krishna, that's one of the processes of bhakti that was discussed in the question answer session previously. Remembering Krishna is one of the nine processes of bhakti. Shravanam Kirtanam Vishnu Smaranam Smaranam Remembering Krishna. It's a, it's a bhakti process and you it it's a co factor with other activities of bhakti. We also discussed that. But it's just that remembrance of Krishna alone it's the, it's the way that Prahlad achieved perfection, remembering Krishna always. Perfection. He went back to Godhead. So we will also just remember Krishna. So how do we take the circumstance? How do we address ourselves to the circumstance? Let's hear from the BBT. And I'm going back to the verse because the words become important. This is our BBT commentary based upon the, the writings of our Acharyas. Srila Siddhar Swami explains this point, this jiveta, according to uh, law in India, which follows the law of Manu, at least this one does, that the, the property of the father, well, he doesn't have to write a will, it goes to the eldest son, progenitor, the law of progenitor. His debts also go to the son, but the property of the father goes to the son. 
So if the, if the son simply survives the father, he will inherit his properties, the father's property. So in the case of Brahma, who is his father? Lord Vishnu, Garbhadakshay Vishnu, that's his father. So if he just lives his life in devotion, then Mukti Pade Sodaya Bhak, he'll inherit the kingdom of his father, which is Goloka, excuse me, the, the spiritual realm. He'll go back to Godhead, Mukti Pade Sadaya Bhak. Just has to do this one thing, just stay in devotion to the personality of Godhead, tolerating the circumstances that are the, re the reaction of the Atma Kripam, the, our past misdeeds. Next in his commentary, Susamikshamana, that's this word up here in, in blue. The word Susamikshamana indicates that a devotee earnestly awaits the mercy of the Supreme Lord, even while suffering painful effects of previous sinful activities. You have to listen carefully, it's really nice. Lord Krishna explains in Bhagavad Gita that a devotee who fully surrenders unto him <clears throat> is no longer liable to suffer the reactions of his past karma. Correct? Pa Bhakti has the power to dissolve the reactions of past karma. In fact, it has the power to dissolve even the tendency to do more karma. So, if you become a devotee, we're trying to become devotees. If you become a devotee, your karma is absolved. That's the good news. So then why is there some difficulty? We're be I become a devotee, how come there's a difficulty? However, because in his mind, uh-oh, the mind. In his mind, a devotee may still maintain the remnants of his previous sinful mentality. The Lord removes the last vestiges of the enjoying spirit by giving his devotee punishments that may sometimes resemble sinful reactions. So <clears throat> here's Lord Brahma. He has this uh-oh experience. Oh, I made a big, I made a big offense. I'm going to get a big reaction for this big offense. Now he, it was induced by Krishna to do what he did for the purposes mentioned, so he could speak these nice prayers and instruct us how to deal with difficulties. <clears throat> so in this life, <clears throat> or in previous lives, we may have. Not only may have, we certainly have done some mistakes, made some mistakes. Maybe, according to Jiva Goswami, offenses. And then we're carrying the reaction of those sins and those offenses today from stuff way back. Now, bhakti has the power to take those things away. But we may <clears throat> hold on to such tendencies although the reaction is taken away. So Krishna is very kind. <clears throat> and one of his kindnesses, this uh, susamikshamana phrase, is he'll take away that tendency. And one of the ways to take away the tendency is to give us a circumstance that looks like tribulation. It looks like a sinful reaction. And the purpose of that circumstance that looked like a sinful reaction is to take away the tendency, to let go of it. No, it doesn't guarantee we're gonna let go of it, but it's the opportunity to let go of it. We can still hold on to it. <clears throat> and whine and complain, how come I'm undergoing some tribulation? And still hold on to the tendency. But it's a special kindness. Tribulation for a devotee is being described by our acharyas that way. So now, 
what's the purpose of creation? I, one of the <clears throat> Rathiatras that we had down by the lake, at least the festival at the, at the lake, I was introduced to um, one Chinese lady that had been coming to the temple. Her name was, is, Tu, T-U. A very short name, Tu. So when I was, I was introduced, she said, I just have one question. And it was the one question. Why creation? Hmm. That's a thoughtful question. So <clears throat> in this purport, it's actually two main purposes, but one of those two main purposes is the living entities that have misused their free will, they have a rebellious spirit against Krishna. is to rectify that. The purpose of the entire creation of God is to rectify the living entity's tendency to enjoy without the Lord. So that's the tendency. If you recall, I mentioned Prabhupada was speaking about one lecture in San Francisco in 1969 about crushing the seed of material absorption. He spoke yesterday evening about nirvana. That's nirvana crushing the seed of material absorption. There's what's beyond nirvana, but just crushing the seed. You can't go beyond nirvana. You can't go into the spiritual realm if you, you still have that seed. So we're devotees. And we're engaged in devotional service, trying. And that seed of being the independent enjoyer, separate from Krishna, of things that are Krishna's, that's a tendency. So crush the seed. So circumstances may be given in our lives for that purpose. We may not understand exactly how and all those interesting things. But there's, at least in principle, therefore the particular punishment, now it's not exactly a karmic punishment because there's no karma, but the punishment given for a sinful activity is specifically designed to curtail the mentality that produced the activity. So let's do it again, slow motion. Remember yesterday evening. According to Buddhism, the root cause of suffering is desire. Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur says, no, no. The root cause of suffering is ignorance. The primordial ignorance is ignoring Krishna. And from ignorance comes ignorant desire. Because there's a soul influenced by ignorance and you desire ignorantly. And from ignorant desire comes ignorant activity. And from ignorant activity comes ignorant reactions. Vipakam in, in the verse. It's, 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 we're suffering because of ignorance. And the cure is take away that ignorance, take away the ignoring Krishna. So we're devotees. We're trying. This question came yesterday in the question and answer session about is nirvana a kind of bad attitude towards Krishna? Well, it's ignoring Krishna. It's ignoring Krishna. The ignorance still remains. So if ignorance still remains, what's going to happen? Suffering is going to... You can, you can undergo anesthesia for some time and not feel any pain. When the anesthesia wears off, you're going to feel the pain of the surgery or the dental extraction or whatever it is that you are under anesthesia for. So what's the solution? The solution is bhakti, and, and, and specifically, remembrance of Krishna, taking that position of shelter in remembrance of Krishna. It continues, same message. Although a devotee has surrendered to the Lord's devotional service, 
until he is completely perfect in Krishna consciousness, he may maintain a slight inclination to enjoy, or maybe more than a slight inclination, to enjoy the false happiness of this world. So, tribulation, this verse is teaching us, Brahma is teaching, he's our the head of our sampradaya, is teaching us how to face tribulation. It's a mercy to take away the residual tendency to be an independent enjoyer. That same primordial ignorance, ignoring Krishna and let me be the enjoyer of Krishna's property. The Lord therefore creates a particular situation to eradicate this remaining enjoying spirit. Now again, from the pr prior pr part of the purport, it may look like a karmic reaction, a sinful reaction. It's, for the devotee, it's not. It's, a, it's, an, it's another purpose altogether. Another source and another purpose. This unhappiness suffered by a sincere devotee is not technically a karmic reaction, semicolon. It is rather the Lord's special mercy, again, for inducing his devotee to completely let go of the material world and return home back to Godhead. And then it's a long, very long purport. It's just a little bit more. A sincere devotee, we're trying to be sincere devotees. So there's a quality that sincere devotees share. They earnestly desire to go back to the Lord's abode. Now, in Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's teaching, he, Mama Janmani Jamanani Ishware Bhavatad Bhakti Rahai you can give me birth after birth in this world, that's okay. Um, I simply want to be engaged in your service. And being engaged in your service, that's back to Godhead. Being with the Lord in his spiritual atmosphere, his spiritual abode, because his abode can descend wherever he is, and you're with him. If you're with him by strength of undivided, unconditional, two important adjectives, devotional service, then you're with him always. Without the, the longer story, Prabhupada said, please understand, I'm always with Krishna. And Krishna is always with me. So back to God, it doesn't mean like get on a 747 or some kind of a craft and go somewhere. It's, it's consciousness. Because when that consciousness is there, Krishna is there. Krishna is there in his fullness. That's the Bhagavatam's message, the Pashat Purusham Purnam. In his fullness, Krishna is there for, because he's attracted by the devotion of his devotee. And the devotee is attracted by him and his wonderful qualities and loving nature. Even when there's a difficulty, even when you're Lord Brahma. Even you're whoever you are. We'll hear some more. Yeah. So, again, Rupa Goswami makes reference to this verse in Nectar Devotion or Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. This is very important verse. It's our solace in a place where there's tribulation. Don't expect you become devoted to, to Krishna and you'll have no tribulation. Don't expect that. Just take minimally. The body's going to get old. And, you know, some of you are younger. But when the body gets older, things that used to work don't work anymore. 
and pains that you didn't know could be painful start to be painful. And, you know, the, the machine breaks down. You can't do what you, you can't. You said lots of things you can't. You can't see, you can't remember, you can't. You, lots of things. Things just, the machine breaks. And when the machine finally breaks, you just toss it away and get another one, like another car. Stop repairing the car, you just get another one. So that's the, that's the arrangement. Old age, disease, and death. And then, you know, lovely part is you do it all over again. Birth again. As long as there's attachment, as long as this seed that hasn't been crushed is still there to be an independent enjoyer. It's, 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 it's very subtle, and it's something that as devotees we need to be mindful of. It's what brought us here, and it's what keeps us here. Birth after birth, from higher to lower circumstances of life. Happy, all the, all the whole spectrum of duality. Happiness and distress, lower planets, human species, heavenly realm, even beyond heavenly realm, and it's all temporary, and then back down again. It's really, uh, it's a mistake to, to cling to that independent enjoyment spirit, but it's a very strong tendency. It's, it's, it's the primordial ignorance that brought us here and keeps us here. And Krishna's, this verse is teaching one of the ways, it's not the only way, we can just let go voluntarily. But if we hold on, Krishna is still very kind and he can help us let go, even a little less than voluntarily. But still it has to be voluntary because love is voluntary. You have to say yes instead of no. So, uh, Jiva Goswami has written a commentary on this verse, naturally. He's actually he's two different places, Kramasandarbha and his Tattvasandarbha. And he speaks of this verse and also his commentary on uh, Rupa, Rupa Goswami's writing. Anyway, he says this word Jiveta in the verse just all you have to do is be alive but not like just physically alive the alive he explains means alive in devotion or alive and awake in your relationship with Krishna that's what's required just do that through the tribulation don't get all caught up in minimizing the tribulation I mean you can do some practical stuff you take uh, some medicine if you have a medical problem. Or you'd make practical arrangements. You fasten your seatbelt when you get on an airplane or ride in your car. You do practical things. But tribulation is going to come, and you're expecting it. Don't, you're not surprised by it. And then death comes, and you know things come. Somebody you know, some, some anyway. Just stay awake in your relationship with Krishna. And Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur also comments, and it's just, it's, it's nice and it's long, but I'll just make reference to something specific here. He makes reference to a, a similar verse in the Bhagavatam that comes in relation to Prithu Maharaj. The image is kind of blurry, but it's, on my computer it's not. This is Prithu, the coronation of Prithu and his wife Archie. And there, at the function of his coronation, Lord Vishnu comes. And there's Lord Shiva offering. So many offerings are made to King Prithu. He's a, an incarnation, Shaktivesh avatar. And when Lord Vishnu appears at that sacrificial arena, there's a long section of prayers. And one of those prayers says, Yata chared bala hitam pita svayam. Bala is a child. So, and pita means father. 
So he says to Lord Vishnu, you are like the father and you've come to offer me some benediction, but I'm not going to ask for anything. You know best because you're the father and I'm just the child. And so as a father, not waiting for the son's demands, does everything for the benefit of the son. Please bestow upon me whatever you think best for me. That's the right attitude. That's what this verse of Lord Brahma is teaching, according to Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. And just a few other references, that just developing the theme of remembering Krishna when we're passing through some difficult circumstance. This one is <clears throat> Bali Maharaj. Now, so there's some new people here. You don't know who Bali Maharaj is. He's, uh, he's a devotee. And Bali Maharaj was performing a sacrifice. Well, the, the, the Brahmanas were doing the ritual for a yagya or sacrifice. And um, Lord Vishnu appeared in this little form of a dwarf brahmana named Vamanadev. And Bali Maharaj was so enthused. Look at this effulgent, extraordinary, exceptional brahmana. And he was, by nature, charitable. So, how fortunate you've come to the sacrifice. Everything is now auspicious by your sacred presence. I want to give you charity. Ask for anything. I'm the emperor of the whole world. Ask for anything and it's yours. He said, I'm just a little boy. I don't need much. Just three paces of land. And Bali looked at his short legs. You're a dwarf. Three paces of land. But if that's your wish, so the wish was granted. And one pace covered the whole earth. The second pace covered the universe. His body became gigantic. And his second pace poked a hole in the covering of the universe. And the causal ocean started pouring in. So Vamana said to Bali, you promised me three paces of land, but you've only given me two. So he said, well, you can put the third pace on my head. Benedict me. So he gave everything knowingly to Lord Vishnu. But to teach a lesson, as it says, to show the glories of his fully surrendered devotee, what did Vamana Devi said, oh, you've given me everything, but you didn't give me three paces, so I'm going to punish you. He had him tied, him up, tied up, as you see in the image here like a criminal. He just surrendered everything with love. He tied him up like a criminal. Harsh, apparent. And there was this whole commotion. Hey, that's not right. And the grandfather of Bali Maharaj was Prahlad. And Prahlad came and said, no, it's, it's good. And then Lord Vamana spoke some words of appreciation and glorification of Bali. And essentially he said, I did this tying him up to show his greatness because he didn't protest. He didn't try to, hey, wait a minute, you know, I did good. Now you're giving me punishment. That's not right. And if you want, you can do something, but don't tie me up like this. I'm, I'm, I'm this powerful king and treat me with dignity. And he didn't, he didn't protest at all. So Lord Vamana said, I wanted to show, just see the quality of Bali. And then he explains our theme for this morning. A devotee is sometimes put into adversity while executing devotional. This is the verse spoken by the Lord, Vamana. 
A devotee is sometimes put into adversity while executing devotional service. In adversity, everyone laments and becomes aggrieved. But by the grace of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, a devotee, even in the worst condition, can understand that he is undergoing a severe examination. We don't like exams, academic ones for sure. And then there's life exams. And when you're a devotee, you don't want to be examined. You want it to be like things are nice. But sometimes there's an examination. Bali Maharaj passed all such examinations as explained in the following verses. Actually, that's the purport. Sorry. So Prabhupada explains. This is Prabhupada's purport from the Bhagavatam. The Supreme Personality of Godhead sometimes puts a devotee to severe tests that are almost unbearable. What could hardly even live under the conditions forced upon Bali. That Bali endured all these severe tests and austerities is the mercy of the Supreme Lord. The Lord certainly appreciates the devotee's forbearance. Now, where do we get qualities like forbearance from? From the same place you get everything from. So if we depend, as Brahma's prayers say, you depend upon the mercy, susamikshamana, of the Supreme Lord, then you get whatever you need in order to pass the, the exam. You get an A in your exam. Doesn't mean you don't do your homework before you take the exam. You prepare for your, whatever it is, your SATs and your final exams and your whatever it is, this, you know, the academic stuff and occupational stuff. We, 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 we do what's needful, but the ability comes from Krishna. And if you're in the consciousness that I'm doing this for Krishna, that's Krishna consciousness. And Krishna gives you all the ability you need. In this case, when there's an ex exam of how much can you tolerate, he'll give you all the tolerance you need. That's what's being said. The Lord is so kind to his devotee that when severely testing him, the Lord gives him the necessary strength to be tolerant and to continue to remain a glorious devotee. It's a nice, it's a very important verse. It's referenced by Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur in his commentary on this verse by Lord Brahma and a few other examples and we're done. Another nice example is King Chichiketu. Again, our new devotees don't know who these personalities are, but he was a, a king that had an attachment to have a son and one sage visited his palace and the sage saw this man is over the top attached for something that's not meant to happen. And that's when you suffer you, something that you wish to have, it doesn't happen. We hear that repeated in a moment. Which it actually was from yesterday, we'll hear it again. Bhaktivinoda Thakur, stay tuned. When we want something to happen, it doesn't happen. Very intensely, we want something to happen. It doesn't happen. We, we feel some pain, some unhappiness. So the king wanted a son, it wasn't to happen. A sage, Angira Muni, gave this arrangement by a yagya that he could have a son that would be both happiness and distress. The king was very happy, the son was born, but then the co-wives poisoned the little baby, and he was sad, very sad. So Narada came and gave him instruction in how to bear reverses that come in life, which are exactly our topic. And it's, with, with, it's without attachment to the circumstance. If you're, it's possible if you're attached to the Supreme Lord, that's bhakti. If you always remember Krishna, then the circumstance doesn't cause distress. 
So the king was very elevated. He got it. And he went and left his kingdom, took a situation of exclusive devotion to the Supreme Lord. He became a highly elevated personality in a heavenly planet in his very lifetime. And then the painting shows, a little blurry. Is this, maybe you can fix the focus. You know how to do that? A little better. So he came in this vimana, like a, a traveling craft that can go between one planet and another planet. And he went to visit Lord Shiva, his friend. He was so elevated. Shiva was his friend, like equals, very elevated. And he made some remark that Parvati thought was criticizing Lord Shiva, so she cursed him. You become a demon. And he didn't become disturbed. Wait a minute. I was complimenting your husband. You're cursing me to be a demon. Have you misunderstood my words? He didn't do that. He just accepted. There's a higher plan. I don't know what it is. There's a higher plan of the Supreme Lord in this being cursed by Parvati, and I accept it, whatever it is. But one thing is, I, my mind will not budge an inch from this position of taking shelter of the lotus feet of the Supreme Lord. So that's what he did, and he became a demon, and he went back to Godhead from a demon's body because his mind was fixed, always remembering Krishna. Another nice pastime with a blurry image that's really clear on my screen, but what to do? Uh, this is Indra, who similarly made an offense, and he was going to get his reaction, and he knew it. So he came before Krishna and offered prayers to Krishna. And the, the kindness of Krishna was Krishna just removed the pride of Indra. Because when you're very opulent and your heart's not pure, it's a tendency to be proud. So the best solution is to get a heart that's pure. Somehow go get one. <laughs> Work on making your heart pure. And then you can have or not have. You can have opulence or have no opulence. You can have this or not have this. You can have that or not have that. You can have any circumstance and you're, when the heart's pure, you're contented. Until then, you're stuck. So now, uh, each one of us, what's next? You know, the, the crystal ball. One, one of the messages of the verse of Lord Brahma is where there's this fate that's going to come. You, you know the word fate. It's the hand of fate. Something's going to happen. It's in, you know, it's in your horoscope and yada, yada, yada. And something's going to happen. So what do you do when something's going to happen? You face the something that's going to happen with full trust that Krishna will carry you on the other side of that thing that's going to happen and give you the strength and the tolerance and the intelligence and the capacity. That's going to happen if you keep your mind fixed upon the Supreme Lord. That's what this verse is saying. Two more things and we're, we're finished. There is this image of Bhaktivinoda Thakur. Um, Hemangi wanted to have a copy because she said it was pertinent to something she was planning. Here it is again. Jaiva Dharma message. How can the mind dominated by lamentation, fear, anger, greed, envy, etc., meditate upon Sri Krishna? A devotee may become affected by lamentation and illusion because of the death of a family member or because a covered desire, excuse me, coveted desire 
remains unfulfilled. But he must not allow such feelings to paralyze and cripple him. And it is natural to mourn the demise of a son. I'm going to send this to a devotee in China. They'll have to translate it. it uh, they lost their mother. And it's been very difficult for them. They're very, very close to their mother. And it's natural. Mourning for a de departed dear one is just part of life. It's not unnatural, Bhaktivedanta Thakur is saying. But one must quickly overcome such unhappiness by taking shelter of Sri Krishna and praying to him for solace and strength. In this way, a devotee must train himself to always remember the lotus feet of the Lord in all circumstances. And our last reference is here. Actually, there's more than one. Fire of ordeal. This is a phrase uh, given by um, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. And it, it's, it appears in more than one place, but one prominent place is in his purport to Brahma Samhita. You know the verse, Yastvindra Gopam Atavindra Maho Sva Karma. So the Supreme Lord dispenses karma for all living entities from the, the tiniest, the Indra Gopa germ, <laughs> up to the, tom, the topmost situation of those who are demigods, the devas, atravendram ahosva karma. So when karma comes by the natural arrangement that you do something, you receive something. That's this vipakam word in the verse. The action, reaction. That's karma. Action, reaction. Not only the action, it's the reaction. It's part of the package. Um, Bhakti Siddhanta's purport, very short. God impartially induces the fallen souls to act in the way that is consequent on the deeds of their previous births and to enjoy the fruition of their labors. That's for the non-devotee, all living entities. But out of his great mercy to his devotees, he purges out by the fire of ordeal, the root of all karma. So what's the root of all karma? It's ignorance. Because behind desire, ignorant desire is ignorance. So namely, nescience. Nescience means ignorance. And from ignorance comes ignorant desires. So it's the same message. The ordeal that the devotee is put through. I'd like to see a show of hands of anyone who has never been through an ordeal in life. We've all had that experience. When you become a devotee, it's not that ordeals stop, but there's another purpose behind it. It's to uproot nescience. And what flows from nescience? Ignorant desires, evil desires, and then evil activities and things that, that cause bondage and suffering. It's, that's, the, that's the purpose behind it. It's like, you know, I, I was asked by um, a devotee, I, I think, what? There's some movie, and they're asked, you know, the truth pill or the illusion pill, the red pill or the blue one. What's it called? Matrix. Matrix. Okay, great. So what do you want? You know, you want the, the blue one or the red one? And the reality pill is, for the devotee, it's not Krishna promises you'll never have a tribulation. Become a devotee, and it's shanti, shanti, shanti. That's not the promise. You never get old, you never get disease, you never die, and you'll live forever in, in bliss. That's not the promise. Uh, on the material side, the, but if there's some difficulty, 
there's a wonderful purpose behind it. And that's the, this fire of ordeal message. Look at the verses. Text 54 of Brahma Samhita, if you want to go back and read it again. Two other references, and I'm, I'm done. Bhakti Siddhanta spoke about this from time to time, and it's natural that a great acharya is addressing the feelings and the needs and the false shelters of people of this world, his audience, his students. So in, in Dhaka, um, Bhakti Siddhanta spent a whole month, a whole month, lecturing on one verse. He wanted to prove and, or demonstrate that within, the, within Srimad Bhagavatam, there's unlimited meaning. So one, one, one Bhagavatam, he spoke on one verse for a whole month and never repeated himself. So there. <laughs> and it could have gone on for months. But in those Dhaka verses, they didn't have MP3 recorders, but some persons kept record of what his messages were. Um, those favored by God find their path set by thorns. Let, not, let me not desire anything but the highest good for my worst enemy. Supposing somebody causes you pain. How do you, how do you address that? Desire their good. There's no peace or happiness in our worldly life. Circumstances create turmoil and annoyance. Supposing somebody says some malicious bad thing about you. I won't ask for a show of hands if anybody's never had that experience because we've all had the experience. Be indifferent to bizarre gossip. Bazaar is like, you know, marketplace worldly gossips. Stick firmly to your cherished goals. No lack or impediments of the world will ever stand in your way. A devotee feels the presence of God everywhere, but one averse to the Lord denies his existence anywhere. And then another, chant the Maha Mantra loudly and without attachment. This will drive away inertia, Worldly evils and pests. It doesn't mean just mosquitoes. Um, yeah. So there's additional examples from our scripture, and they're really nice, but I think the message is clear. Always remember Krishna. And never forget Krishna, even when it gets tough. In fact, it's a privilege when things get tough. It's a special kindness of Krishna. He's Hari. Hari means one who takes away. But when he takes away things that are inauspicious, with the same thousands of hands, he gives auspiciousness in his place. He's not unkind. The... the Affinity for being an independent enjoyer, that's our disease. It's the root ignorance. And he's kind. He wants to help us. It's a great opportunity. It's a great privilege. It's a great kindness. It's not easy. It's easy to say it. Then when the tribulation comes, oh... important message because we, we live in the world of duality and sometimes and sometimes sometimes it's good fortune sometimes it's ill fortune sometimes it's honor sometimes there's it's dishonor sometimes it's hot sometimes it's cold sometimes it's arctic cold it's the place of duality and it's not just well it could be worse I mean Get the message that when, when there's the, the place of duality, is, it's not meant for us to be the enjoyer of. Something else is meant for us. 
and take that shelter of that something else that's meant for us, this position of devotion to, to the Supreme Person in love, then the real happiness is there in any circumstance is okay. Not like lovely, but it's okay. Anything, any comments or questions? Yeah. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Um, as we understand that Krishna gives the strength to the devotees to go through the testing circumstances, uh -huh. uh, is there anything from my side that any prerequisite that we have to do. And uh, I'm also connecting this to the fact that we get the strength to carry uh, our spiritual teachers or spiritual master instructions. The strength is and there. And Krishna's the, too, by the way. In the instruction itself. In Krishna's too, yes. So is there anything, any prerequisite or anything that I have to do from my side? Remain faithful. Trust in the relationship because Krishna is trustworthy. He'll never let you down. And it's just like, you know, you have children and you're not gonna act cruelly to your children, but you may sometimes deny something they want. You may you know, negotiate with them, but you know, there may be some things you just deny. And it's not out of cruelty. It's kindness. And a child or a devotee of Krishna that understands the master is trustworthy, they won't complain. Because they understand that the place that it's coming from is kindness, that, that, that the being deprived of something that you want or whatever it is, that the feature of dwelling that's coming away, it's, it's kindness. So that's, it's faith that's not conditional. That's the, that's the quality that you, you, that will, you need to strengthen. We, each of us needs to strengthen. Something else? Yes, right behind you. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, in the purport, it, uh, it was given that uh, the devotee waits for the mercy of the Lord yes. and suffers the reactions of his deeds. So, how does Lord choose whom to give mercy? I mean, how does the sun choose where the shine will go? Shine goes everywhere. Yes. And the mercy goes everywhere. But supposing somebody hides under a rock, then the shine, the shine doesn't go under the rock. So just come out of the rock and, and then the mercy is there. It goes to everyone equally. The sun shines equally. Clear? So yes. what wrong are people doing, those who are not there in the temple? Well, it, 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 they're making choices. Mm -hmm. There's free will. Mm -hmm. They say no. And there are varieties of no. And according to the variety of no, that's what they, then there's a reciprocation with their variety of no. Not that the merciful Lord wants them to say no. But he doesn't interfere with their saying no. Otherwise, there's no free will. And then there's varieties of no. And then he reciprocates according to the varieties of no. That's called karma. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Right over here. Hi, Krishna Maharaj. I was wondering, um, how quickly do we supposed to overcome uh, situations? Uh, how quickly? Because uh, sometimes when situation, something happens, what was the last word? How to overcome the situation? Or tribulations. Tribulation. The stuff, right? Um, how quickly should you overcome it? How quickly? It? Yeah, because you know well, sometimes I like to hold on, on to you, stuff. It, 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 each of us is different. How quickly is it's individual dependent, and it, it, it like this depend. The first question, faith. Supposing this is 
Um, uh, Jankatananda Pandit. Supposing you want to cross a river. Supposing you're foolish and you want to put one foot in this boat and one foot in that boat because you can't decide which boat you want to use. Jagatananda advises, don't try to cross the river with one foot in two different boats. You'll end up in the river. Mm. So, we're trying to cross the river or the ocean or the, the, the material existence. And depending upon where you place your feet, it's going to be different experience. So, at least in principle, Jagatananda is advising, please... <laughs> Be clear. The mission is to cross the ocean of material existence and put both feet in the, in the boat of bhakti. No, but I'm, well, wait a minute. <laughs> Suppo I'm, I'm new here and I'm not ready for both feet in one boat. Then we'll struggle. Okay, I have another. Um, so I was thinking, right? <clears throat> When Krishna eradicates things that are not good for devotees, well, personally, I perceive that as the opposite of free will. Because Which it's is what? Mercy. Why is it the opposite? <laughs> because you don't have to let go. Mm. Brahma didn't have to let go. He chose to let go. Mm. Mm. Bali didn't have to let go. He chose to let go. Mm. And we also have a free will choice. Mm. You can say no, or you can say yes. And sometimes Krishna just pulls it from under your feet. You know? No, there, there, there's free will. Yeah. The circumstance is outside of our control, but the free will choice, how you respond mm. to the circumstance, isn't taken away. Mm. There's a very interesting book, um, trying to remember the author's name, Man's Search for Meaning, Viktor Frankl. You can take note. He, it was written during World War II. He was a Jewish uh, psychologist in a Nazi concentration camp. He didn't write the book when he was there. He wrote the book when he, was, he survived. And how he survived, he explains in the book how he survived the ordeal of the concentration camp and how Krishna helped him survive the ordeal when he was being dragged off to the gas chamber. It's like, it's, it's in the book. But one of the things he says is on this point, one thing that cannot be deprived from any man in circumstances that are outside of their control, there's sometimes circumstances you just can't do anything about. Here comes this Arctic cold, you can't do anything about it, but the cold. You can choose how you're going to respond to it. Circumstances of life make sense. That not you become a devotee. Now you have control over the circumstances. Not, you have a, you have control over the choice that you make. <coughs> he says that, that directly. Not you know verse and chapter from Bhagavad Gita and Bhagavatam, but it's a principle. How you can how you're going to behave and how you're going to, the, the conscious choices that you make in face of adversity. But you said that Krishna will punish us in a way so that it will eradicate that bad. Well, it, he'll give us the choice. He's not, it's not, it's not a done oh, deal. Oh, so that, that's a choice. Sometimes it seems like it's just it, like, no, right, there's choice. I gotta get rid of this. The circumstances are not our choice. How you respond to the circumstance, mm -hmm. that's your choice. Mm -hmm. I see. Now it's clicking. Ah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. So Ball. He always has these long questions. <laughs> well, there's, there's two questions from the internet, oh, Maharaj. Okay. And there's one from myself. Oh, okay. I keep it short. Uh, first question is, could you explain the difference between reactions from past misdeeds versus reactions from offenses? It is 
Is it involvement of Krishna in the second one? Yes. A, a, a short answer is just as the, the action of sin is serious depending upon the nature of the sin, let's just like take the example of accidental death and way over on the other side is first degree murder. And then there's stuff in between. So punishment by law is dependent upon the, the nature of the crime. Now, karma similarly is diverse in its severity, because sin, <coughs> its reaction to the sin is diverse. And the power of bhakti has the potency to immediately, no delay, immediately eliminate sin and the reactions of sin. And the distinction between sin and offense is offense is more severe. And put it this way, offense and reactions to, reactions to offense have the power to block the power of bhakti. I'll say it again. The nature of offense is um, anartas in the heart. And anartas, the reactions to offense, has the power to block the power of bhakti. Sin and the reactions of sin does not. So offense is more severe. Still, what to do about sin? We go on with the activities of bhakti, specifically in our case, chanting of the holy name again and again and again with sincerity, not committing further offenses. And that anartha can be diminished as opposed to immediately vanquished. That's a distinction between the two. Bhaktivinoda likens the two. One is like um, mist and the other is heavy clouds. Mist is much lighter and clouds are much thicker and there's degrees of clouds. Okay, so next question. Next question is, is being ignorant of Krishna while executing duties and cheating from Krishna is the same thing? Example, Indra in the past sense of Govardhan Lila, uh, is it ignorance or cheating propensity? Well, it's pride and pride uh, I mean it, 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 in his case it was both it, the offense part was he tried to he, his intention was to kill the cows and the residents of Vrindavan and Krishna it, it, was, it was pretty offensive it was more severe than what Brahma did Brahma was just what's, what's Krishna going to do Indra wanted to kill them. But there was also ignorance. I mean, it was arising from his not seeing Krishna as he is. And that got cured, both. Those pride was from ignorance and from offense. Now your short my, question. My short question is, uh, <laughs> the, the message is that Krishna takes care um, he makes the arrangement for to eradicate ignorance. Yeah. In Lord Brahma's example, he is taking the position that is not Krishna making the arrangement is from his past misdeeds. Is that something that we have to follow like that? We don't supposed to see that. Well, is his, his his misdeed is he just did it <coughs> like the same day. He just kidnapped the, the calves and the coward boys. That's an offense. And he's going to get a reaction for that offense. His past misdeed is going to have an, a reaction. He knows it. Now, does that address your question? When, so when we go through our deals, sh we're supposed to say, okay, this is my karma. This is from no, my past misdeeds. No, 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 no. No, I see now what your question is. It's, it's, it's our, 
the, the, the misdeed is the pri minimally the primordial misdeed. Ignoring Krishna. This is to help me become free from that one. It's in the purport. Read the purport again. It's very clear. Mm. I think we should end. We'll take one, oh, two more questions. Two more questions. That's it. Um, Maharaj, when you said um, that when you do things for Krishna, then Krishna gives you the ability to do it well, my initial reaction was, I should do my job for Krishna so that I can do it well. And I feel like that's a really manipulative way of thinking. And I'm wondering how, I'm so used to thinking that way, how can I change that into like a service mentality? Love. In one word. <laughs> Same as this letter that you recently wrote, but you know, it's not, I'm at the center. Love is, the other person is at the center. That's, that's what love is. The interest of the beloved, that's my interest. Not the interest of the beloved can take care of my interest. The, the beloved can take care of me. That's selfish. The other is, the interest of the beloved, that's my interest. That's love. And so it's, we're not there yet. Instead, it's, you know, lust. L love has been transformed. It's about me. And lust doesn't just mean, you know, something gross sensual. Love, excuse me, lust is exactly as you were quoting. It's, it's I, I'm, I want to be the enjoyer of stuff. I'm at the center. It's Maya. So in Maya, well, I, I'll get, you know, Krishna to take care of my stuff. And then it's, it's business. I'll do because he'll do. And if he doesn't do, wait a minute. I may check out. You know, either explicitly or silently or you know emotionally so the 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 cure is love and we have to cultivate that that's that's the bhakti sadhana bhakti is the cultivation of that now you can do sadhana bhakti because i'll get you know the good thing according to what we heard yesterday um Bhakti Mnod and Vishwanath say that's that's what that's what Vaidhi Bhakti is. Because I'll get something and I don't want, you know, the, the punishment of not getting the something that I want, of being deprived of that something that I want. That's Vaidhi Bhakti. Now what to do about that? That you're you're questioning, that's your very question, how to get to the stage of love. And and, and he and the, the Acharyas tell us we go on with the hearing process where purification takes place and the compass starts to move towards Krishna. And then it becomes the real, and then bhakti begins. <laughs> you know those phrases in the Bhagavatam. Because the other is, you know, selfish. That's bhakti. I don't want to suffer, I want the happiness. I want the good thing, I don't want the bad thing. It's me. And bhakti is, at the mature stage, it takes time to get to the mature stage. But then that's when the mind, you don't have to instruct the mind anymore, it goes. Until then we have to instruct the mind. You know, pick up your beads and do your chanting because you're told to do so. And it's good for you. You know, eat your spinach. It's good for you. Okay. There's a more mature stage of bhakti that leads itself into a taste, attachment, ecstasy, love. It's a sequence. And 
in between us and that is the anartanavritti stage where it's there's this stuff inside that's blocking so we're still selfish krishna is in the picture for convenience sake gets me what i want and i don't have to go undergo the the, un, the unpleasant things i don't like it's a good business deal he's a good customer for my business <laughs> last question over here Hare Krishna Maharaj um, part of my question is already answered but uh, maybe still uh, you mentioned that uh, my question was when the tribulation comes it depends on the tribulation how much you can you know strength to overcome that tribulation and still take the shelter maybe one after the other if it comes you know you don't the requirement have is not overcoming the tribulation that's not you know the litmus test of how successful you are in krishna consciousness it may just be that you endure the tribulation really nice example i think i shared it but anyway here we go uh in toronto it's record breaking cold like 12 degrees celsius colder than ever before in the history of toronto it's colder in toronto than in the north pole you know this during this while uh, we're experiencing whatever we're experiencing and there's 50 teams of devotees going out door to door hoping they get inside a nice door to sell bhagavatam sets because they made a pledge and the sankirtan leader is like you know got vaisha sheka horsepower going you know they're really inspired by him and 50 teams of devotees in this cold are going out till they meet their quota their pledge because he visited there and they made a pledge and they're going to meet their pledge it's colder than the north pole so who wants to go out but they're going out so they're they're tolerate it's not like it's going to get warm because they're krishna conscious they're overcoming they're just tolerating yes so the test is not you overcome the, the tribulation necessarily you may but you you stay faithful to the lotus feet of krishna throughout there's one thing krishna should be pleased that connects with this question swetha was asking okay we have more <laughs> No, my, my uh, when we tolerate uh, while tolerating the mind you know we are instructing the mind not to yes. take the false shelter yes but again you know as uh, yeah. in Bhagavad Gita you sure. know it tends sure, sure, you know, sure. but sure. still goes as long so, as that seed is not crushed the mind is going to go there Bhakti has the power to crush the seed and nothing else not your determination, willpower, you know, good karma, and everything else. So what are the practical ways we could... You, you cultivate. Know? Faithfully. Consciously cultivate. Going in the direction of relying upon Krishna only. That's, what, that's Brahma's verse. Go back and read the verse, read the purport. And be happy. Srila Prabhupada ki jai.